This is the last panel uh, for the, the entire forum in this area, uh, but it's a very sensitive one and a very important one. Uh, what we're talking about here is improving perceptions of mining in society. Uh, as I said, very sensitive, very important. I'd like to uh, welcome our moderator, Emily King, who's the founder and chief executive officer of Prospector out of there in Florida in that sense. So, Emily, the floor is yours. Thank you. All right, would you guys like to Excuse me, mate. come join? We're going to be a, a close, intimate group today, so everybody feel free to pull up. Yeah, I think you, can, you guys can sit wherever you like. All right. Well, thank everybody. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I know we're closing out the session, but perhaps with the most important topic, because I don't know about you guys, but I've heard this mentioned on almost every panel I've listened to the last two days, that we as an industry are so frustrated that nobody gets how wonderful and important we are, right? So how do we change that perception? Um, so I guess I just would like to, Joe, if you guys could actually introduce yourselves real quickly, since we've got, um, yeah, different mics yep. and go down, yeah. Uh, hello, yeah, uh, Chris Can, managing editor of uh, Aspermont, which has Mining Journal, uh, Mining Magazine, and a few other mining titles globally. Hi everyone, Rohit Eshtawan, uh, CEO of ICMM. Hi, I'm Marna Klüter. I'm the president of Ivano Mines. All right, awesome. So we've got a, a wide range of different parts of the industry here, which is really exciting. Um, so I think I, I wanted to start the conversation today just articulating what is the problem, right? Because uh, as we were all emailing back and forth, I think most people who are inside the industry understand there is a perception issue, but is it a true perception issue or a misperception issue? Right? Is it that we're doing everything right and people still don't get it? Or is it that we're doing things right or something's wrong and that's creating a perception issue that everything we're doing is wrong? So I wonder, Chris, maybe we can start with you. What do you, oh, wonderful, hi. Yeah. So we also have Carol Cable joining us. Just, yeah, wonderful to have you here, Carol. So if we could just kind of go down the line, but then open it up for a bit of a discussion around what do you think the problem is? Why do people perceive us as dirty, nasty, evil <laughs> um, folks that just are looking to ruin the earth when in reality, most people in the industry love to be outside, are hugely um, focused on keeping great care of the environment and local populations. So what's, what's the issue? I wouldn't necessarily say it's a, a misperception. I'd probably mm -hmm. say maybe it's a partial mm -hmm. perception. So um, when you look at even just very recently, the, the track record, you look at Australia alone, you've got multiple reports about discrimination, mm -hmm. uh, sexual harassment in the fly-in, fly-out um, part of the industry. You've got You Can Gorge, the disaster there. Obviously, you go to South Africa, you've got continuing fatalities in the deep precious metal operations. I'm sorry I'm not painting a particularly great picture to start off. Um, and then obviously in Brazil uh, you've got multiple tailings disasters. Yeah. So I don't think that it's an unearned uh, perception the things that we could do better. I think obviously what's missing is the positive side mm -hmm. of the story. Um, and I think we probably don't promote it as well as we should or could because we haven't had to previously. Mm -hmm. I don't think people have cared as much. We've not been as close to the consumer as we are today, and we've been caught napping uh, to some extent. So mm. I think, you know, previously uh, people used to buy a kettle that boiled the water the fastest. Today they, they buy the kettle that boils the water the fastest that is made from Irma certified materials. It's right. been produced in a factory that operates to the highest possible standard and is delivered to the retailer in an EV. And I think that's probably something that's happened very, very recently. That's been quite a significant change that, uh, and we haven't caught up with that. Mm. Yeah, and Ro, what do you think? Yeah, Emily, my, my, my view is that perception is reality. Hmm. So you asked, is there a challenge? Well, if you Clearly. look at the numbers, there is a challenge. Globescan, a very highly respected polling organization, polls people in every country, well, in 31 countries every year. They ask the question, to what extent are the following sectors meeting their expectations of society? In 2021, mining ranks last. Mm. Below tobacco, below oil and gas, 
below every other sector. Uh, we can say that's not fair, and I agree it's not fair, because the story is incomplete without the positive. But this conversation must start by facing reality in the face. And the reality is that the perception of people puts us at the bottom of the list on our contribution to society. I can tell you, Marna will tell you, all of us will tell you, that is not true because of what we actually add. But let's remember that that's how the world sees us. Yeah. Maybe from my side, just to sort of touch on a few points. Mining is a risky business. Mm -hmm. So we do tend to see the worst of the mining industry play out in the media. And that's what creates the perception. If you look at the perception on the ground, uh, we are a highly regulated industry. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no room for error. You get stopped. In the areas where we operate, if you make a mistake, your mind gets stopped and that has a direct impact on your business. But you usually operate in a social context where 80% of the people do not care about what you are doing. 10% of the people love you. Yeah. They're at every meeting, they want to be involved. And 10% have issues. They mm -hmm. have issues with you. And then there's 1% who hate you. Mm -hmm. They're activists. No matter what you do, it will not be good enough. It will never pass master. And unfortunately, bad news sells. You know, if there's a story to be told and it's negative, it will, it will catch the, the waves and it will go global. The good news will not travel. Mm -hmm. It will not travel. It doesn't matter if we go out and promote it. It will not travel. And the problem about promoting good news, if you promote it yourself, it seems like you're talking your own book. Yeah, people don't believe it. People yeah. don't believe it. So what we need to do is we need to start convincing our communities and our stakeholders and people who see what we do and how good we are doing it to start telling the story. Mm. That's what we need to do. Um, I wouldn't disagree with, with any of that. I might just pick up on, I think, Chris, your point. Uh, which is that the mining industry has traditionally seen itself as being a B2B industry. Mm -hmm. And I can remember um, when 10 years ago, pitching to companies and even funny enough, pitching to the ICMM at that time, 10 years ago, um, trying to explain that, um, you know, ab about how mining needs to approach its communications. And every single company came up to me afterwards and said, Carol, but you don't understand. We're not B2C. We're B2B. And my response then was, yes, you are B2C, but the C, the, the C is not consumer. The C is citizen. So the relationship between mining and the citizen is incredibly important. And I totally agree with what Marna says, because one of the, the, well, not one, there's many, many great things at the industry that companies do. And the one thing that companies do really well is their relationships on the ground. Because as you say, you get shut down, or you, know, you have your communities that are next door, and you have to have a relationship with them. I think that what is missing now is that is a is sort of a, a broader sense so if we have understanding of mining and support of mining sort of at the mine site we're certainly we certainly don't have it on the on the street my kids who have been brought up with their grandfather's been in mining his whole life i've been in mining my whole life and my kids hate the fact that, <laughs> that I'm in mining. So their generation, you know, that 20 something year old, is not, it's, you know, what we're saying is not cutting through to them. And then you say, well, why is that? Well, like, what has changed? What, you know, how has the perception changed? And I think the perception of, of the industry has changed in a number of ways. One of which is society's expectation um, on, well, scrutiny and expectation on business has increased enormously, certainly over the last five or, five or 10 years. And on the sector, it has increased enormously over the last five or 10 years. You just think about what's happened over the last few years with Black Lives Matter, Roe versus Wade, Me Too, the Russian-Ukraine war, climate change, you know, um, the cost of living, the increase um, sort of rents um, being sought by government and by, and by communities. 
that's not a new one. That's a that's an age old one, but um, you know these are are big issues that society is expecting business to respond to, and if mining still only sees themselves as B to C, or sorry B to B, and doesn't think they need to respond to societal expectations and societal issues and things that society and that my kids care about, then we're never going to change those perceptions. Yeah, and I. Uh I, I host a podcast for any of you who aren't already subscribing. You can look up On the Rocks in any of your podcast apps. But I just did one with Dr. Hayden Mort, who runs a wonderful, cool company called Geologize that helps teach geoscientists how to communicate, um, especially with social media. And he shared with me a really interesting statistic that, or uh, a thought that he had that most mining companies, when they approach communications, and in particular what they call stakeholder communications, they're really doing investor relations, right? The mining industry is constantly raising money for exploration and development, so you get in this habit of, of really talking a lot to your investors, which is critically important, but it's a very different way of communicating, and the information is different that investors want to know and need to know than the larger society and stakeholder community. And so our whole industry kind of has a communications structure and you know professional community that's geared towards investors. And uh, he was explaining to me that there's actually a statistic that 70% of your share price growth is based off of reputation. Um, which I thought was really interesting. And that's not just mining, that's across the board. And yet for some reason, again, with mining, the, the brand reputation, which isn't just what's my latest drill results, what are my latest production numbers, right? I mean, there's a lot more to that brand reputation than just those updates, which I thought was really interesting because uh, in our team, we have a lot of really young people, some of whom I've hired away from mining companies to come work and they run like our TikTok, <laughs> which I always joke is, I call it the TikTok, right? As someone who's a little old for TikTok. But, but that is where the young generation is seeing information. TikTok, Instagram, um, you know, social media, podcasts, it's, it's a shift and it's hard. It's hard to tell those stories. So I wonder if any of you have any thoughts about that where part of the perception issue might be the vehicles we're using to communicate um, and how do we kind of get more comfortable with that. Anybody? Maybe I can just offer, so it, it really depends on where you operate to, to yeah. a large degree as well. I mean, we operate throughout Africa. So we do a lot of community and society engagement. You, you cannot not do it if you mm -hmm. operate in the jurisdictions where we are. And what we've developed in um, Mokopani in particular was a Wi-Fi that we put out to our communities, and it was actually one of our most successful social projects mm -hmm. that we did. If we get feedback, they all love the free Wi-Fi, and we developed an app so that people can go and seek jobs, they can see what procurement opportunities are mm -hmm. available, and that gives people direct access into your business, and they cannot complain that they don't know about the opportunities, but we also enabled them through this app to go to websites, to seek right. jobs, to do CVs, so there are modern ways of communicating with your audience because audiences, no matter where they are based, are sophisticated. Um, when it comes to the younger, more modern generation, I think we maybe need to do a bit of education about where cell phones come from. Right. Um, so that they understand that without those raw materials, they would not have all the technological things that they are also addicted to. Yeah. And, and maybe we should start with some basic education in terms of raw materials and where things come from and, 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 and show how the industry are doing work on the ground. I, I mean, we are all held accountable on so many fronts to do things responsibly and to mine for a great purpose that, you know, we, we don't have a choice but to do things the right way. Yeah. No, bro. I see you're ready. Yeah. Emily, ICMM is not on TikTok, but <laughs> I can tell you that in 2021... You can sign up today. We should. <laughs> in 2021, the videos that we produced on Twitter and LinkedIn mm -hmm. were watched by over 100 million people. Wow. And so we could, I could attend this conference every day of the year and not reach right. anywhere close to 100 million people. And that's the power of using new technology to get a message out there. So Marna, part of that is educating people where the materials come from, Part of it is sharing with them what we are doing to minimize the risk. So you said mining is a risky 
business and bring positive benefit. So that's an example of where new technology can really help. But Emily, just to tell you one story of how, how much of a mountain we have to climb. Uh, last year, a member of the University of London, that's Birkbeck College uh, in London, some of you may know this, implemented a rule that there are two sectors who cannot, will not be allowed to recruit their students. Mm. Oil and gas and mining. Can you imagine that one of the major universities in the UK wow. has stopped mining companies recruiting young people on campus because apparently our industry is bad for the world? Mm. I mean, th that's extraordinary. And it shows the mountain we have to climb to get the message that nothing, no modern life is possible without mining. But yeah. yet, that's the perception that people have. And I wonder, um, I know we're jumping a little bit into what we said we would talk about next, which is how do we fix it? But I'm the mom of a seven-year-old, uh, and she loves rocks. And I will tell you, all of her friends love rocks. It's uh, we, Whole Foods, you know, in our neighborhood. You walk into Whole Foods, and there's a whole aisle of crystals. And everybody in, I live in South Florida, everyone's into crystals and their healing power, and they ask me about it. I'm like, you've got, the, um, that's the wrong kind of rock person, right? Um, but the kids go straight for that aisle, right? You take them into shops, they love the polished stones, and they love to play in the dirt. I mean, and, and it seems like there's a lack of not just education, but marketing and communication, even at that age, because then it just drops off. And I've been preaching to everybody while I've been here, I think we need like a kid's TV show right, that highlights geology and mining, the same way every kid knows what a doctor does, every kid watches Paw Patrol and there's a construction puppy or, you know, I mean, it's like these other industries that are so prevalent in children's media where people kind of instinctually then understand as they get older what it means, why it's important. Um, so, you know, I think the next step is a production company to start putting together scripts. Yeah. And if I could just pick up on that, at that point, because Avatar 1 and Avatar 2 has not done us any favors. Right. Yeah. Uh, so the, to your point, I think you're absolutely right. We need to, we need to combat that. Yeah. And what about Minecraft? So yeah. Minecraft, why are we not all somehow joining forces with Minecraft, which is all about mining and building stuff and, and games, and it's amazing. Yeah. Um, I was in Brazil about, I don't know, four years ago, well, three, four years ago, and I met a guy, I don't, I don't play Minecraft, but apparently this guy has got a bazillion followers because he is the guy who takes videos about how he explains to build things and build mines and things like that. And in Brazil, he has yeah, millions of followers. And um, one of the Brazilian mining companies um, got in touch with him and said, well, have you ever been down a mine? <laughs> and this guy said, no. And he goes, well, how can you be such an expert on how to build a mine when you've never actually seen a real one? Why don't you come down a mine in Brazil? So they got this guy to go down into an underground mine with his video, with his camera, and he video videoed his entire experience and he was blown away by how professional it was, how clean it was, how safe it was, and just you know saw the whole process literally from soup, soup to nuts and recorded it live. And you know that's the sort of stuff we probably should be doing more of. Yeah, and I don't know if has anybody in here ever been in a in like a mine virtual reality setting? I mean, it's very similar, and it's so cool. I got the opportunity to do it with one of Newmont's mines, be in their VR environment, and it's like you need to make this available. Like it's such a great investor relations or stakeholder communications tool, all of that. I mean, it's, it's really cool. Yeah, well, any other, any other closing thoughts on what the issue is? Or did you, Chris, yeah? Uh, I, just probably a little bit of insight on Rose's comment about Birkbeck. I actually went to Birkbeck mm -hmm. um, a few years back and um, talking to people about this when it happened, I, I wrote a letter to The Guardian, a letter to the editor, embarrassingly, it didn't get published. But I thought if you're gonna to speak to someone, speak through The Guardian as opposed to The Times or one of the right-wing or right-leaning publications. The geology department wasn't consulted. So it was a, essentially a student activist group, left-leaning obviously, and we're all a bit left at, at university probably, um, that pushed this agenda and then the policy makers decided that without consulting anyone, they would put that through and make it, mm. make it rule, make it fact. And from an educational institution, it's just mind-boggling, like a, 
the ignorance from a group that's meant to be enlightened when you're looking at ruling out extractives. If, if you want to ignore the fact that the oil and gas industry actually probably has the biggest investment budgets in renewables as well, right. okay, if you want to ignore that, but if you're ignoring that, then you're saying renewable energy, we're going to rely on metals. So to rule out mining as well just shows a profound level of ignorance. Um, so equally disgusted by, by that. Um, and, and other universities around the world are following suit. It's cool these days. It's fashionable um, to, be, to, to be progressive and liberal in that kind of context, which is, uh, which is pretty upsetting. Um, the other one, Emily, on your point, um, we've got a freelancer, a guy called Alex Harrison, who's produced a kid's book on mining. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, it's available on Amazon if, uh, if anyone great. wants to look it up. Yeah. No, I think that's what, you know, when we look at how do we fix the issue, uh, you know, one of my key concerns about the kind of lack of progression we've had, I think, is because we talk so well to each other, <laughs> right? I mean, we come to conferences and it's people who are already in the industry, are already interested. Uh, we all kind of know it's an issue. We know about how all these minerals are used. And yet there is, a, you know, there's local engagement, certainly by individual companies, but it seems like from the industry as a whole, um, other industries for somehow seem to have done a better job of communicating, yeah, and I know you're teeing you up here, uh, to you know, talk as one voice, essentially, about some of the key themes. So how do we get everybody together, maybe, and not have it just be on Ivan Ho or Numa, you know, not individual companies that are responsible for telling that story, but the industry? Well, I think you've just told me I'm doing a crap job. <laughs> That How can we support you more, perhaps, would be the, yeah. Well, before I feel too bad about <laughs> myself, the one thing I should tell you is that ICMM brings together 26 of the world's largest mining and metals mm -hmm. companies. We account for one third of the industry, mm -hmm. right? That sounds like a lot. We have 650 sites globally across 50 countries. There are something like 14,000 registered mining companies. That's registered companies, not those that we don't even know about. Yeah. And they have between them about 30,000 mine sites. So when you say mining industry, what are we talking about? Are we talking about this group of 26? Are we talking about companies like Ivano? Are we talking about the group that we will never be able to reach? Mm. So you know, it's a really important aspect to keep in mind that there's not a single industry that you can speak on behalf of because it's so distributed. Yeah. I, I loved Marna's point about how we can tell our story, but it will be looked upon as suspicious. Mm -hmm. And just to get that in our heads, I hope many of us have had well-earned holidays over December. Now, if you stayed in a hotel, I would ask you, how did you choose that hotel? Did you go on the website and say, this hotel looks great, I'm going to book here? Or did you read the reviews and say, other people say this hotel is great, so I'm going to book here? Mm -hmm. I almost think we need a trip advisor for mining, where people can comment on mining and say, this is my experience of mining, you're much more likely to trust that than you are to trust any one of us sitting here on the panel saying mining does good things. No, it's, it's interesting that you say that because there, are, there is a group of what we now call geo-influencers, right? You know, there are people that make these videos about geology and mining, but uh, the, the same gentleman, uh, Hayden Mort, was saying that he, he works with a lot of them and they actually do not want sponsorship from large mining, or I should say from any mining companies because they believe their followers will no longer trust them. Right, so how do you deal with that if the content generators that are in those new forums also don't want to be associated because then they're, and it, I think it just gets to that tremendous gap in, in a lack of trust of the industry. And I'm certainly, I certainly don't have an answer for it, but I think it's, it's a lot harder than sometimes we talk about. I think we maybe anticipate that if we just talked more about how much metal there is in iPhones, that people would get the message. But there's something else there that, again, other industries have been able to address. Because if we're last, that means we're lower than, like you said, oil and gas and tobacco. Like, how can that, how does that happen, you know? So <laughs> I'd like to pick up on points that all of you guys have actually made. And that is, um, you know, and to your point, Emily, how can we just, we keep telling everybody that they're not going to have a cell phone if there's no mining. There's not going to be, we're not going to reach net zero if there's no mining. We've been telling people, not the net zero conversation, but certainly the cell phone conversation for about 15 years, and it's still not working. It's still not cutting through. So something's not right. 
and we need to do, that's what we need to alter. We need to alter the way in which we communicate because it's not fit, fit for purpose what we've been doing so far. So I think I would like think about how do you flip it on its head in that case because you know we talked about Minecraft or Ro talks about a TripAdvisor. The thing about TripAdvisor which is so great is that it's it's the people who use the service that have their own opinion about how they want to use the service. Some people want to, will reply on TripAdvisor saying this was a ripoff and it was too much money. Other people will say this was great because the food was amazing. Other people will say this is amazing because the service was great. So it's 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 looking it's the the way in which the industry I think needs to address it is look through the the stakeholders eyes, look through their lens, look through their, you know, what do they care about? What do the stakeholders care about? And how do you communicate to them on their terms? You know, is it yeah, great service? Is it great food? Is it great price? Now, the only, re the only way to do that is data. The only way to find out what your stakeholders actually care about is asking them the question and then responding to that. And by the way, that can be really scary because sometimes you ask a question and you really don't want to hear the answer because you, don't, you might not necessarily know how to deal with the answer or you might not necessarily want to deal with the answer. But you still, we still need the data to be able to inform, you know, to be able to inform our decisions. So it, it really is make, putting the stakeholders views their their views and their and the thing that they care about the most first i wonder also uh when i think about industries that are really popular and that people like and they're excited about right now i mean i think about technology in particular right and we operate in that space as an ai based platform and there are very visible um, vocal and personality filled individuals <laughs> in the technology space, right? I mean, there are people that the general population kind of associates with innovation. Elon Musk, I mean, you've got like four or five different companies, right, that people immediately associate him with, and that's just, just one example. And I wonder also how we as a community can put forward the characters who, let's be honest, there are a lot of them in the mining industry. We are a really quirky, <laughs> character-filled industry for everyone to think that we're really boring, right? Because if anybody's been to a party at PDAC, like, I mean, there's a lot of funny stuff going on, right? Like, we're a fun industry, and we have a huge amount of stories and adventures. I mean, we're as close as you can get to treasure hunting, right, as a, as a job. Um, and I just wonder, what can we do to perhaps elevate that aspect of our reputation? Who are the, the leaders and the voices that maybe people could personally connect with um, as opposed to just, you know, corporate images and, and stuff. Yeah. So, I work for one, <laughs> of, the, one of those personalities. <laughs> and I think he already has quite a big platform. And I mm. think he's doing a lot in terms of selling um, mining as, as, a, as a much needed element in getting to the net zero um, 2050 target. But... Um, the problem with mining is there's so many commodities that's mm. being mined out there. So when you talk about mining as an umbrella industry, you have to differentiate between a copper miner, a coal mm. miner, a, a gold miner. And how do you treat this broad brush industry as one thing and try and yeah. promote it as one thing? You can promote copper. Mm -hmm. There's a good story to tell about copper and we can put a person on a pedestal and say this is the copper guy yeah. and he's going to tell you the copper story. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a very complicated industry. It's not just mining. It's like talking about farming. What are you right. farming? You know, there are, there are different things to farm, different things to mine and some of the things we mine aren't that useful yeah. and it's a dirty process to mine it. Yeah. So, so we need to be honest with ourselves that some commodities are more attractive than others. Than others yeah. And then we need to promote those and we need to show how we are doing it as responsible companies. And we need to be honest with ourselves that not all companies are responsible. Like Ritesh was saying, not yeah. everybody's an ICMM issues. member. Yeah. Some people are, would like to be ICMM members, but it's an onerous process to get there. Mm -hmm. And then there's companies who, who, who do not want to be a part of the ICMM and they just want to do things they've always done it in the past. So it's very difficult to talk yeah. to one industry, but we should create these spokespeople and we should get the good stories out there. Um, but we should also think about getting our stakeholders out, mm -hmm. uh, out there. And, and talking about what our stakeholders want, I mean, that's a, it's a 
very broad question. It depends on who you talk to. If you talk to a community member, they want a job. Right. They want a procurement opportunity. If you talk to a climate change activist, they want to see that there's going to be sufficient copper available so that we can get to our net zero targets. Mm -hmm. So it, it depends. If you talk to government, they want to see that there will be sufficient taxes coming out of the mine so that we pay back to the, commu to the, to the government and the areas in which we operate. So there's different objectives for different stakeholders. And, yeah. and you need to try and do things in a way that you can meet all these demands within the ambit of being a responsible mind and then still try and polish your image to show that you are doing things the right way. Yeah. So it's very difficult and it's very complex. Yeah, a lot of uh, things pulling you in different directions in reality. Yeah, yeah, and absolutely. I know you've got to run with oh, thanks it. Thanks for having yeah. me. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, the last question as we wrap up, on my podcast, I've been asking everyone the same question at the end of each episode. Um, so I'd like to, to start with Carol. Carol, if you could wave a magic wand and change one thing about the mining industry overnight, what would you change? Well, given that we're talking, because that's a pretty big question, but given that we're, that we're talking specifically about perception and reputation, I'm going to fo focus on that. And I would say if I could change one thing, it would be attitude. Mm. And by that, I really mean about attitude towards um, thinking that as an industry or even as a, as, a, as a particular company, well, we've always done it this way, so why do we need to change? Um, that an, a level of arrogance around, well, we're scientists and we're engineers and we know what we're doing and the person on the street really has no clue because they just don't understand the arrogance of let's just keep telling them that they need mining if they want to have a cell phone. So it is really, it is, I guess that's what I would really like to see, to, to really see change is that, that attitude to, to really to um, take a view about, take more of an empathetic view about stakeholders' priorities. And Marna's right, every stakeholder is going to have different priorities. Of course they are. And that doesn't, shouldn't muddy your, your message that should just make you sort of more collaborative to understand and be on the same page and that and and the, the yeah the same page as those particular stakeholders because at the end of the day if we're not co-creating and if we're not collaborating with our stakeholders then i don't think we're going to change the dial on perception mm. no great yeah well. Because it's a magic one, yes. uh, Emily. Anything, I, anything at all. Yeah. I'd love to be able to implant a chip in all of our brains in the industry that forces us to recognize a trade-off between control and legitimacy. Mm. What we would love uh, at the, as the industry is 100% control and 100% legitimacy. Yeah. In reality, they work in opposite directions. You can have 100% control you likely have 0% legitimacy. Yeah. Or you can say, I'm going to give up some control, I'm going to share some power, mm. I'm going to work with you, and in return, I'm going to get some legitimacy. Yeah. So I hope that we could bring that into the way we think. Now, the, the important question, though, is what metal would the chip be made out of? <laughs> um, I'll try and link this back to perception. Um, you don't have to. Yeah. If I was waving a magic wand, it would be around the way we explore. Mm. And when we look at the money that's put into exploration and the companies that are actually looking for things. Yeah. The majors don't have huge budgets, relatively speaking, for exploration. We've got about 1,500 companies that are listed probably that are just explorers. Mm -hmm. And they're all scratching around on small little patches of land. Um, and they're All trying to raise money from the same people, yeah. Using very small, small yeah. budgets as well. Um, and this is not a, a new concept, I'll be honest and candid. I think Mark Bristow's been championing this for a while. Um, but essentially, what you would what you would have is a major exploration company. Mm -hmm. Bring all the bring all the land together. Bring all the management teams. There aren't management teams with talent to run 15, 1800 yeah. exploration companies. We don't have that much talent if we're honest with ourselves. So get good management on an aggregated mm. package of land that can excite people and that would actually generate the money. Because at the moment, from the perception perspective, we have small patches of land with pretty average management, small budgets that fail as a consequence, 
investors are let down, their perception yeah. is that they shouldn't invest in the junior mining sector, and then the same patches of land go around in under different management, equally inadequate, but with a smaller budget. But they and rename not, them. But they rename it, depending <laughs> on the commodity for That's the chips right. in Rose World. Yeah. Yeah. No, awesome. Well, thank you, everybody. And what I'd like to do, if, if anybody in the audience is willing to, I'd like us to all get one big selfie together. So real quick, before we wrap up, since it's the end of the panel, if we can all stand right here. Oops. Oops. So we'll stand up here. No, no, we want everybody else. Come on. Yeah. And I'll tag all of you on LinkedIn so you all get credit. All right, everybody squeeze in just like one big party photo. All right, ready? One, two, three. All right, awesome. Thank Thanks, Thanks for joining. Well yeah. yeah. All right, pleasure. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome.